Hey everybody, Dr. White here again. Um, you know, lately we have been doing a lot of clever work to find out about, you know, various transformations of random variables. You know, a lot of, um, a lot of like working out to find their marginal, maybe by some clever integration. And, and, and the cleverness is a lot of fun, a lot of fun. But again, uh, you do wonder if there is a more systematic way to get at things without having to be so clever all the time. And way back in chapter three, um, the moment right back in chapter two, the moment generating function uh, kind of came in as this super method for um, finding out a lot about random variables without having to be so clever. And I'm wondering if uh, it could help out again in this situation to you know, help us learn more about you know, things like sums or other linear combinations of um, several random variables. Uh, so let's investigate to see if that is the case. So um, first of all, a little bit of a background and review. Uh, remember that very important fact that we've used several times now that if X and Y are independent random variables, then the expected value of the product is the product of expected values. And I'm gonna go ahead and trot out a proof of this. Um, we haven't really talked about why it's true since way back when we were only dealing with discrete random variables. I'm gonna trot out a proof where you're imagining that they're of continuous type and be a little bit more careful about how you would show the integration, uh, just to convince you this is really true. So like say that you needed the expected value of um, x times y, and so you, um, you go ahead and integrate over the entire sample space um, of the bivariate random variable x comma y. Call that sample space s. You know? And then you integrate, you know, possible value times the, the PDF, okay? So um, when you set that up as a double integral, in general, the way you would set that up is you would pick one of the variables, you know, to be the outside variable. And then the inner integral, the bounds on the inner integral would depend on your choice of the outside variable because you've got to stay within the sample space all the time. Um, so like, for example, uh, something that we've met a few times is when the sample space looks like that upper triangle there that I've shaded in. So it's in the first quadrant, but it's above the line y equals x. So the sample space for just the marginal random variable capital X is clearly zero to infinity, like everything on this positive X axis. But then for each X in that sample space, there's a limited range of Y's. The Y's that you'll be able to look at are the Y's so that X, Y is in the sample space for the bivariate random variable. And so uh, that would actually be the set of y's that are bigger than x, right, from x to infinity, because you got to be above this line where y equals x. And so the way you would have set up that integral would be x is in its sample space, 0 to infinity, and then y has to be from x to infinity, you know, possible value times PDF. And, you know, so that's how you would, in general, write out a double integral in this kind of situation. You would be integrating over the sample space for whichever marginal you chose. In this case, I chose x. And then your inner integral would be the set of all possible values for the other random variable, as long as the ordered here still keeps you inside the sample space for the bivariate. And then what you're integrating over times you know, the PDF. But when X and Y are independent, then that set there 
does not change as X changes. You know, you don't have a situation like this where your interval gets a little smaller every when you increase the X. <laughs> you know, the Y interval here is like, it has to be, you know, from X to infinity, so it gets to be a smaller half open interval every time you increase X. That's not happening with independence. With independence, knowing X should not have an effect on what Y could be. And so actually, this set here is going to be equal to the sample space for the marginal Y, no matter what X is. And so you should write your double integral like that. Okay. Furthermore, because of the independence, you can factor the little f of x, y to be the product of the marginals. That's the definition of independence in bivariate. And so you stare at that thing and you see some possibilities for calculations that we've done before. Um, the x and the f sub x of little x are not going to change with the y that's changing in the inner, inner integral, so you can factor them out of that inner integral. Okay? And then you stare at this, and you think of it as this integral over dx, and then you realize this stuff here in the parentheses doesn't have any x's in it, it's just a number, and so it could factor outside of the integral over the sample space of x. So here it is outside, and here is what's left. But what's left is just the definition for expected value of capital X. And what's outside here is just the definition of expected value for capital Y. And so you get a commutative view multiplication. That when X and Y are independent, the expected value of their product is the product of their expected values. And by the way, that works for several random variables. The expected value of a product of independence is the product of their expected value. Similar kind of argument. You'll just be working with a joint PDF over n variables instead of just two. Okay. That's our background. But now, let's let T be just any fixed real number. And let's say X and Y are independent of each other. Look at this transformation of X, E to the TX. Look at this transformation of Y, E to the TY. Those are also two random variables. But this first random variable is built only on X, and this second random variable is built only on Y. So like knowing what e to the tx is shouldn't tell me a darn thing more about what e to the ty is than I would already know, and vice versa. So those two things ought to be independent. That's a hand-waving argument. There is a math way to prove it, but we won't stop to do that. Okay. Now, consider a sum. Consider x plus y. What's its moment-generating function? I've been building up to this. Watch this. The moment generating function for the sum at any number little t would be, by definition, the expected value of e to the little t times the sum, capital X plus capital Y. Now, by properties of exponents, the stuff inside the expected values could be written as e to the tx times e to the ty. So we're looking at a product of two independent random variables because the X and Y are independent. And so that's the product of the expected values. But those expected values are by definition the moment generating functions for the X and the Y respectively. This happens for not just two independent random variables, but for any number of independent random variables. If you need the moment generating function for the sum of n independent random variables, guaranteed it's just going to be the product of the moment generating functions for those random variables. 
So here, this capital pi stands for product. I goes from one to n, these things. Now, if your x1 through xn are a random sample of size n, like they all come from some common distribution x, then this fact specializes down to this fact. The moment generating function of your sum would be this product, but each one of the things in the product is just the moment is the same moment generating function, the one for x. So you get the moment generating function for x raised to the nth power. That's going to be handy. Uh, another good thing to consider uh, is uh, if y is not just a sum, but maybe is any old linear combination of the xi's. And, but let's say the xi's are independent. In that case, the ai xi's would be independent of each other, just like the, the e's were in the previous case, because each is built on a separate xi. So if you did look for the moment generating function of that linear combination, well, that's a sum of independence, so it's the product of the moment generating function of each of the AI XI's. And by definition, that moment generating function would be the expected value of E to the T times the random variable AI XI. And I'm just using a little commutativity and multiplication to write AI times T times XI. But when I stare at that, that by definition is going to be the moment generating function for xi applied to the real number AIT. It's this. So that might be useful from time to time. Moment generating function of a linear combination where your constants are a1 through an, it's just the product of the moment generating functions for each of the random variables, but evaluate them at AI t's instead of just t's. That'll be especially important in some later session, sections. It's theorem 541, but it's super important for later sections. So um, why are all these facts about moment generating function of sums, why are they so important? Well, here's one example why they're important. Let's say that x1 through xn are a random sample of the same Bernoulli. So like they're all distributed like Bernoulli P. I goes from one to n. Okay, they're all independent and they're all Bernoulli P. And let y be their sum. Now, we have a suspicion that y should be binomial in distribution, because when you do that sum, you're summing up ones and zeros. And that sum would count, like, how many successes in, in trials you would have, because each one, each one element of the sum is like one of the trials. And we've had that, you know, we've, we've kind of been using that intuition in previous chapters. Um, well, let's go ahead and just prove it straight out that the sum of n independent Bernoulli p's is a binomial in p. That's its distribution. And let's do it by looking at the moment generating function for y. By the little specialization here, it has to be the moment generating function for a single Bernoulli raised to the nth power. And the moment generating function for a single Bernoulli is the chance of failure plus the chance of success times d to the t. So there we go. And then when you go and stare back, like, you know, if you have, you have, you have it memorized or you look back in the front of the book and you see, hey, that that's shaded in is exactly the moment generating function for a binomial NP. And remember, one of the great properties of moment generating functions is that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between a, a, a distribution and its moment generating function. 
you cannot have two distributions that have the same moment generating function. It cannot happen. And so if this capital Y has that moment generating function, and it cannot be a different distribution than the binomial NP. That's the moment generating function technique. That's what it really, really is. It's riding on that great one-to-one -one, um, correspondence between probability distributions and functions, moment generating functions. No two probability distributions can have the same moment generating function. And so if you see that the moment generating function of your mystery random variable is some particular known moment generating function for some known random variable, then your random variable is distributed just like the your mystery random variable is distributed just like that known random variable. So this is a great way of finding out what's going on with mystery random variables. See if you can get their moment generating function and then you'll know everything about them as long as you, as, as long as that moment generating function happens to be the moment generating function for some random variable that you already know about. And in that process, this bit about the sums is so useful because so many mystery random variables can be expressed as independent sums of other random variables. And then this, this property about moment generating, where moment generating of sum is product of moment generating, will come in here. So um, that moment generating function technique just has a plethora of applications, and many of them you are going to experience when you do the homework. So I'm just going to do a few of them here, a few other ones here. Um, so it's another example. Why is this such a useful technique? Uh, let's define xi to be chi have the chi-squared distribution with r sub i degrees of freedom. i goes from 1 to n. So you got n chi-squareds. Let's say they're all independent. And they might each have their own different degrees of freedom, R1, R2, and so on. What about the sum? What kind of random variable is it? How does it behave? Well, let's get its moment generating function. Well, because of the independence, it's the product of the moment generating function for those chi squares. Go to your head, pull out the moment generating function for a chi square with Ri degrees of freedom. It's 1 over 1 minus 2t to the ri over 2. Kaboom. You're taking the product of those. i goes from 1 to n. Property of exponentials. When you take that product, you can add those exponents. And then when you look at that, you realize, oh, that's exactly the form of the moment generating function for a chi-square with R1 plus R2 all the way up to plus Rn degrees of freedom. And so that sum of chi-squareds is nothing else but itself a chi-square distribution, where its degrees of freedom is the sum of the degrees of freedom of the sum in others. So the sum of independence chi-squareds is also a chi-square. We discovered this using the moment generating function technique. By the way, there's a neat corollary to that. Um, let's say Z1 through Zn are a random sample from uh, the standard normal distribution, Z for short. Okay. And let's make the sum of the squares of those Zi's, call it W. So if you are, well, one way to visualize the capital W is imagine that you're, you live in in space, in Rn. And you're at a pub in the in space universe where there's like a dartboard that has a target that's right at the origin of Rn. And you're throwing a dart at the origin. And you know, your aim is kind of okay. Um, you you can expect to hit 
the dart to hit the origin, give or take some in each direction. And the give or take figure is, uh, well, it, it, it's a variance of one in any direction. There's like n different dimensions. Um, and so like the, and so like say the amount off you can be in the x1 dimension. Uh, on average, you'd be zero off, but give or take about one each way. And let's say, in fact, that that's normally distributed. Your error in the x1 dis dimension is normally distributed with a mean of zero and a variance of one. Okay. And same for the x2 dimension and the x3 dimension and the x4 dimension all the way up to the x nth dimension. Say so your errors are all standard normal distributed and say they're independent of each other. So if you happen to come a bit to the left in one dimension, it doesn't mean that you're going to be more or less likely to come, you know, top or bottom in some other dimension. Um, suppose you're in that situation. Well, notice that that, the sum of the squares, if you let zi be like how far you are off in the ith dimension, then the sum of the squares of the zi's would be the square of the distance that your dart lands from the origin. That's what the w is. Now, we already know that the square of a standard normal is chi-square with one degree of freedom. And so we're looking at the sum of n chi-square ones. So by our little um, previous fact, w is chi-square with n degrees freedom. And so I hope that really thoroughly gives you an intuition of why the name degrees of freedom is used for the parameter of a chi-square. Because when you live in n-dimensional universe and you're throwing at the origin, there's like n dimensions you could vary away from it by, n degrees of freedom that the dice could stray from the origin. Yeah. Did I say dice? Dark. Okay, uh, another little example. How about number three? Uh, let's say that person number one uh, blinks their eyes according to a, a Poisson process where you can expect uh, two blinks per minute. And let's just count up the number of times they blink in the next minute. Call that X1. And uh, X person two, they blink an average of once a minute in a Poisson process. And let's count up how many blinks they do in this next minute. And for person three, who blinks four times a minute on average in a Poisson process, let's count up how many times they blink in this minute. And so we got a one minute where we're watching three people, and we're just going to add up their blinks by the end of that minute. So we're looking at the sum, i goes from one to three of the xi. And let's say they all blink independently of each other. What's the distribution of the number of blinks for the total number of blinks for all three people? Well, we're looking for its moment generating function, which is the product of the moment generating functions of each one. So we go to our head for the formula for moment generating function for Poissons. And here's the one for the Poisson with lambda 2, Poisson with lambda equal to 1, Poisson with lambda equal to 4. Well, property of exponents lets us uh, simplify that down to e to the 7, e to the t minus 1, and boom, that has to be the, that's the moment generating function for a Poisson with a lambda of 7. So it's kind of looking like the sum of a bunch of independent Poissons is also Poisson where the rate is the sum of the rates. Hmm. And so if you had to do a probability problem, Things are pretty easy for you now. You don't have to like make those complicated tables like we did um, when we were doing the sum of x1 and x2, you know, and each of them had that little PMF, you know, that complicated example. Here, we just already know this is a particular random variable. It's Poisson. That's what the sum is. And so we need the probability that um, 
that sum is between three and nine, we just add up the PMF values for a Poisson with rate seven from three to nine. Very, very easy. Uh, let's try uh, number seven in the exercises. Let's say uh, Z1 through Z7 are a random sample from standard normal distribution. Um, looks like uh, we, might, we must be playing that dark game in R7, throw into the origin R7, where W is the square of the distance you add from the origin. What's the probability that the square of that distance is between 1.69 and 14.07? Well, we already have figured out that W has got to be chi-square with seven degrees of freedom. Um, so how would we find the probability? Um, they ask you this question with funny numbers because they have a table for the chi-square distribution in the back of the book. And just happens if you use that table, you, you actually get references to those numbers. But we find our probabilities in R. So if you do get in a situation where you need to find a probability, maybe as a decimal or something like that, just go to R. And then if you're writing homework, tell me the R command that got you the number. So uh, I, if I were doing this for homework, I would say, well, I did P chi square at 14.07 degrees freedom of seven minus P chi square at 1.69 degrees freedom of seven. That isolates the area from 1.69 to 14.7 under the PDF. And it came out to about 0.925 in the console. So don't forget to write in your R if you use R. Um, here's another example. Um, say a pair of fair die are rolled and let S be the sum, find the probability mass function of S. That is not a hard problem. It's one we really thought about way back in chapter two. But let me do a, let me give you a perverse solution to it using moment generating functions, just to show you how powerful the moment generating functions. So let's let xi be the face that lands up on die i, for i is 1 and 2. So those xi's are independent of each other, just dice bouncing randomly against each other. Let's let capital X be their sum. And um, I'd like the moment generating function for the sum. So let me first figure out the moment generating function for x1 and for x2. Uh, for either one, it's the same. The moment generating function for xi, whether i is one or two, is going to be the same. It's the expected value of e to the txi, the sum over the possible values, chance of getting the value times e to the t value. I've decided to use j as my index here because I'm already using an i to index something else. And so I get you know, one six times e to the one t. 1, 6 times e to the 2t, all the way up to 1, 6 times e to the 6t. So, so it, it could be expressed like this. So um, how about the moment generating function for the sum? Well, we got these two random variables. They both have the same distribution. So it would be the product of these, the product of this moment generating function here with itself. And so uh, I write the square like that. And so then I would have to like square out um, six terms times another six terms. So that's like 36 different terms when you FOIL it out. But they do group together in ones that have the same power of E. And so if you play around with it, um, you know, there's only one way to get an E to the T and, and that's by, there, there's only one way to get an E to the 2T. And that's by grabbing an e to the t and an e to the t. And so um, you'll have this 1 over 36 times e to the 2t. Let me see. How many ways are there to grab an e to the 3t? I could grab an e to the t and then an e to the 2t or an e to the 2t and then an e to the t. So that's two ways. Okay. So uh, 2 times e to the 3t would show up in that multiplied out product and I'm dividing by 36. And I just keep on thinking of all that uh, stuff, all the different ways I can get different values. 
all the way up for the highest possible value I could get. If I grab e to the 6t both times, I would have an e to the 12t. And so I stare at this moment generating function for the sum and I realize, oh, wait a minute. Uh, because it's an expected value, it's giving possible values times um, chance of value. And so I'm getting possible values for e to the you know, t times the sum. Oh, so that means these little uh, coefficients here are the possible values for the sum. So there they are, 2 to 12. And those little numbers hanging off the front are the chance of getting those values. So if you are looking at the, um, if you're looking at the um, moment generating function for a discrete random variable, you know, you can read off um, its possible values and its probabilities in that way. So that's a somewhat perverse solution to the problem, uh, but it shows, the, again, the power of the moment generating function technique. Now, we don't usually use moment generating functions um, to find uh, probability mass functions or probability density functions. The moment generating function does encode all possible information about a distribution. And that's because of the one to one relationship between distributions and moment generating functions. But some of that information is more easily accessible and some is more deeply hidden. Usually what you'll find is that, well, it's the moments of a distribution that are more easily accessible from the moment generating function, because those are just, you know, the derivatives of the moment generating function evaluated at zero, easy to find. Uh, whereas things like CDFs and PMFs and whatnot, those would be a lot harder to extract from the moment generating function. And as you can see here, I had to do a lot of grunt work, you know, before I could uh, extract that. I, I had to do all this terrible multiplication of this in order to get this. And it could be done, but it was kind of inconvenient. So the solution is a little perverse, but just wanted to show it, it is possible in principle. So the moment fun generating function is, it, technique is just great. And I might as well just like, take a moment here to say, um, no pun intended, take a moment here to say that the moment generating function, which takes you like from a probability distribution to this you know, real valued function, that somehow encodes all the information about probability distribution and can make hard problems easier because of that, because of that encoding of information. That's something that happens in mathematics all over. In many mathematical disciplines, you are gonna find some kind of transformation technique that takes you from objects of a certain type over to other type of objects. But that transformation is done in this sort of one-to-one -one way so that the new objects encode all the information you've ever want about the previous objects. And, 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 and quite often, problem, hard problems involving the old objects can become easier problems when transformed into problems about those other kinds of objects. The transformation technique, a remarkable idea in higher mathematics. Okay, um, looks like we're done with this section and I'll uh, see you again soon if I can find where to um, stop. Here we go.